I'd like to start with an introduction to software, software and computer science behind it. So what is computer science? Well, computer science is the study of computation. At the lower levels of computer science, we are looking at things like electrical impulses, mathematical logic. You have things like AND gates and OR gates and NOTs, and those translate whether or not there is a, a zero or a one type signal on the line, and it changes those. And then at the higher level, you're looking at computer applications, things you can use, word processors, web browsers, operating systems, all those are much higher level computer science related topics, but they're not really computer science. They're more about things you can build, things that can be created using the computer science, where computer science is all about what can actually be computed and what can be done. Edgar Dijkstra is credited with saying that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Basically saying that computer science doesn't have to have computers because really you're trying to figure out what can be computed. And in fact, when the first people were hired as computers, they weren't actually electronic machines. They were people. And so that's where it came from. It was an occupation that got taken over by, well, computers. Software engineers now program computers and make software. And that software is what drives the hardware that we then use. So what is software? Well, software is code. Software is stuff. Whatever it is, the logical stuff on the computer that tells it what to do. Computers really only do electronics. They do zeros and ones. Either there is a signal or there isn't, or maybe it's a weaker signal. But that's how computers work. Signals, zeros and ones. And these zeros and ones are grouped together into sets. And then these sets of zeros and ones are interpreted as meaning something. So when you are trying to define how the zeros and ones are supposed to be interpreted, you have to create something that tells you what a series of zeros and ones are. And when you're talking about code, there are things like assembly languages, assembly languages that tell you this series of zeros and ones mean this command, do this operation. And then if you're trying to talk about data, well, you have to have a different series of zeros and ones that tell you things. And that's where you have things like ASCII or Unicode, which are basically mapping a series of zeros and ones to letters and symbols and digits and numbers and all these things. They're mapping the data. You also have other programs that define other mappings at maybe a higher level mappings. And this all becomes part of the software. Software includes commands. It includes data and how to interpret and use the data to display things and communicate with the users and with the hardware. So how do you make software? What are the tools for making software? There are actually many different tools you can use for making software. That includes your editors for making the source code, your compilers for converting it into the machine language, the zeros and ones. And sometimes you have these things like integrated development environments that bring everything together. So let's talk about some of the different things you have, some of the different tools you have for making software. First, editors. Editors are pieces of software themselves that allow you to change, to create, modify, and save your source code. You can go in there and edit it. You can make changes. You can create new things. It allows you to modify your source code and then save it somehow onto a medium such as a hard drive or in the network somewhere, which then ultimately goes to something like a hard drive somewhere. Some editors are more advanced than other editors. Some integrated development environments have things like compilers built in, or they have ways to check in and check out code from source code repositories. Some editors have syntax highlighting, which allow you to see 
what syntax makes sense. They might be very knowledgeable with the language you're programming in, and they can highlight things that make it so it's easier for you to read the code and understand what's going on. Sometimes they even provide intelligent completion of line suggestions. They suggest different things in order to figure out what you're doing or to write code that's better or complete, add other pieces. You know, you open a XML tag and they close it. You open a open curly brace and they close it. You open an open parenthesis and they close it. They provide the other side, which makes it easier for you to have better, more complete, more correct code and better syntax that can compile correctly. So then you get to compilers. What are compilers? Well, compilers are programs. They are also pieces of software. And these pieces of software convert high level languages, such as source code, into lower level languages. Ideally, we'd like to be able to tell a computer what to do. Say, just speak normal English to the computer or normal Spanish or normal Chinese or Japanese and just speak to the computer and have the computer do something. The problem is that, well, there's a lot of ambiguity in human speech. We don't actually know what we're saying sometimes. We don't know what other people are saying to us. And there isn't any obvious direct translation of what we're saying into code. So we have to create this subset of a language that we can then use to create a language we can write code in. We simplify things. We define things. We decide some words mean specific things and don't mean other things. For example, the or, the word or, is not the same in the English language as it is in computers. In the English language, or is sometimes the exclusive or, which means one thing or a different thing, but not both. In compilers and computers in software, it regularly means it's either one thing or the other thing or both. So it's more of an inclusive thing. So you have to have, well, languages that are interpreted and converted by compilers into something the computer understands and is not ambiguous. It is very definitive and very clear. And there are two different kinds of compilers. You can have a compiler that compiles your source code and turns it into machine code. And then you can say that machine code for later, or you can have something that is real time compiling and maybe even interpreting where you're looking at your code and slowly working through it. Compilers are made of multiple pieces. You have a preprocessor and the preprocessor will take your code and will try to fix it up a bit for you. <clears throat> In order to write good code, sometimes you want to separate pieces into multiple files. And these multiple files can be recombined at compile time and generate code that's all one piece. Sometimes you want to substitute pieces. You might have substitution things written right into your source code and the preprocessor can substitute things. It can substitute, it can combine pieces, and it can even reorganize your code. Sometimes your code isn't written well, and it knows there are common things people do, and it just reorganizes it so that it can compile it better. Once you are done with that, the compiler takes your code, interprets it, and changes it into machine code. You might have multiple different pieces of machine code, that are separated into different objects. And then you have a linker and a linker can take these different objects and connect them together and make everything work smoothly as a big piece of code. You might have problems with your code and that's where debuggers come in. Debuggers can help you to figure out where things went wrong, where they need to be fixed or just making your code better. When you originally write code, the code can have some things taken care of automatically by the integrated development environment if that is built in. They have a partial interpreter type thing built into a lot of those IDEs, which can allow you to find 
bugs. But then there are also these runtime things where you have problems where it just doesn't work and suddenly things crash. And debuggers can be built into the IDE as well in order to stop code execution, allow you to walk through the code and see variable values as you're going through it. So debuggers are great for that. There are some more simple debuggers which use unstripped code to follow the execution of a program and then allow you to look at individual pieces. Stripped code and unstripped code are kind of different in that if you write your code and you compile your code, sometimes the compiler will leave pieces in there to help you debug it later. If you then strip it out, you're basically removing all these links and header type things you can use to get back into the code and compare your code with the compiled versions. But debuggers allow you to go through the code and find problems, fix them, and make your code better. In addition to using debuggers, another thing you can use to make your code better is a profiler. Profilers are also software type things, which collect statistics about the program figuring out what parts of the program are running, which pieces are running a lot, what code is being executed the most, and also figuring out are there sections of code that don't get reached, that aren't touched. Maybe you have huge holes. Maybe they are very insecure places. And profilers can help you find those and fix them and make your code run better, smoother, and more securely. So then, why C++? Why do we want to look at C++ as a language to write code in? Well, C++ is based off of C, and C was written in order to make the Unix operating system. C++ then came along and added stuff to it. So C++ is basically a superset, or started out as a superset of C plus some other stuff. So you take your C, you add in your objects and you get your C++. C++ has can, since then evolved and become more of its own-ish language, but it still has a lot of the C components. And you can still write C code and compile it with a C++ compiler in most cases. But C++ is much easier to use than C. The objects make it much cleaner, much more organized, much simpler. Some of the things you'll find in C include the Unix operating system, the Linux operating system, which are both written in C, but then you look at what's written in C++ and you find the Windows operating system is written in C++. Windows, you have Microsoft Office, you have lots of software packages that are written in C++ because C++ is a very good language and it is much easier to learn and you can learn more advanced features and be better at other higher level languages by using C++. And then these can be used to create software. So all this information right here is all about how to make and create software.